2021. My name is Alberto Redelli from Politecnico di Milano, and uh, together with Jerome Nelly from the University of Pompeu Fabra, I have the privilege to introduce uh, David Steinman from the University of Toronto. David is a pioneer of uh, image-based uh, uh, patient modeling and of note he has co-founded the vascular modeling toolkit uh, as an instrument that is uh, widely used in uh, our application area. He is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineering and uh, he has been involved in most of the BME strategic initiatives during the years but primarily is an Italian by adoption uh, having chosen the mountain of North Italy uh, as one of his favorite places. Uh, today he will give a lecture on turbulence modeling uh, in between science and philosophy, I would say uh, an evergreen and open issue in biofluid dynamics. The talk will last 30 minutes uh, and it will be followed by 15 minutes of discussion. Uh, please during the talk submit your questions through the uh, chat or raise your hand at the end of the talk. So thank you all for attending this plenary lecture and David, the floor is yours. Grazie mille. Uh, let me bring up my screen. Oops. Hang on. Scusi. I shared the wrong screen. Okay. Can you all see my slides okay? And can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfecto. Okay. I'm going to turn off my camera just because I have a bit of low bandwidth here. So thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, so just to explain the title of my talk, um, you know, we're all, most of us, I, I guess, are, are biomechanicians, and probably we've seen diagrams like this before um, in when we've, uh, oops, just checking my mouse here, um, in lectures on fluid dynamics, and we know that flow is kind of a continuum from laminar to turbulent. However, when engineers talk about turbulent flow, they typically are thinking about kind of fully developed chaotic turbulent flow, eddy cascades, the minus five thirds slope, and so on. What you have to remember is that not all, but many clinicians, when they hear the word turbulent, it can encompass anything from even kind of laminar recirculation all the way through vortex shedding and phenomena of fully developed turbulence. So we've taken to using this word turbulent-like to encompass flow that has um, let's say high frequency components, whether they be laminar vortex shedding phenomena or fully developed turbulence. So what I'm gonna talk about the next probably 35 minutes um, is um, give you some background on sort of where things stood up until I guess the turn of this century around turbulence and body sounds as well as wall vibration and pathobiology. And then I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that each span about 20 years. And then finally, give you a little um, bit of information about future directions for some of these uh, works and ideas. So let's start with a little bit of history. I think most of you appreciate that the 20th century has been a century of medical imaging, starting with Röntgen's discovery of x-rays um, in the very late 1800s to the point where nowadays we have fantastic anatomical and even uh, functional medical imaging technologies such as this X-ray uh, CT imaging in the middle and uh, dynamic uh, cardiac MRI on the right. But prior to that, uh, medical imaging involved really having to look inside the body directly. And so before the 1900s, um, there was a lot of work done on auscultation or listening to body sounds. And this is a, uh, I think it's a mid 20th century painting of um, uh, uh, Lenec, uh, who invented the stethoscope as one of the primary tools and kind of the key tool, I guess, for being able to listen to sounds from the body in a non-invasive manner. 
So I think probably most of you are aware that the body produces sounds. I think anybody who's gone to their doctors, had a stethoscope placed on their heart, knows about heart murmurs and how those sounds can be used to potentially diagnose various cardiac disorders. Um, anyone who's had their blood pressure measured, um, you may not be aware of Karotkov sounds, but these are the sounds that are used to decide when the pressure cuff has reached systole and then as it's relaxing, diastolic pressure. And some of you may be aware that uh, within the head, uh, the presence of um, arteriovenous fistulas or aneurysms or um, various other disorders may cause cranial bruise, uh, i.e. noises, or hums. And when I picked this um, particular illustration to, to illustrate this, I also came across this story, which I think kind of is emblematic of how much we've sort of lost in terms of our thinking about auscultation. There was this picture of an Indian doctor placing the stethoscope over the eye of a patient. And someone posted this as a way of, you know, making fun of these third world doctors who don't know how to use a stethoscope. And on Facebook, this, uh, this doctor kind of chided everyone to remind them that, you know, this technique known as orbital auscultation is a non-invasive, inexpensive way of potentially diagnosing or detecting cerebrovascular disease if you don't have immediate access to fancy medical imaging tools. So all of these body sounds are thought to be related to uh, turbulent flow. However, I have to say there's still a little bit of hedging in the literature on whether it's truly caused by turbulence. This is a paper, a quote from a paper from 2002 that says murmurs are thought to be created by turbulence. So again, there's just a little bit of hedging about this. So in 1970, there was this um, kind of seminal paper published by Gary Ferguson, who is a neurosurgeon at the University of Western Ontario, doing his PhD in medical biophysics under the great Margot Roach. And what Gary Ferguson did was, um, with his supervisor, they built glass models of aneurysms, as you can see here, um, looked at the flow patterns to decide if they were laminar or turbulent, and found them to be turbulent even at Reynolds numbers on the order of 500 or less. Then as a neurosurgeon, what Gary Ferguson did is when they opened up the patient's skull to perform aneurysm surgery, he placed a phonocatheter, basically a microphone, on the aneurysm sac to listen to the sounds coming directly from the sac, and you can see these at the bottom right. His hypothesis and what he demonstrated was that turbulence causes the vibration of the vessel wall, and that this turbulent blood flow may contribute to the degeneration of the elastica within the wall, and therefore may promote the development of aneurysms and or their risk of rupture. But not everyone agreed with this. This is a paper from 74 that looked at animal models of arteriovenous fistulas and aneurysms. And while they observed um, AV fistulas with considerable vibration activity over a wide range of frequency that's characteristic of turbulence, the aneurysms exhibited no such sounds or the random appearance of turbulence. In 1987, um, this model study uh, in saccular aneurysms reported pseudoperiodic fluctuations in irregular vortex trails, basically what I would say is laminar vortex shedding, but not fully developed turbulence in these experimental aneurysm uh, models, and that this was unlikely to occur in vivo. So where are we at the end of the 20th century? Well, by you know the end of the 20th century, um, we had routine 3D medical imaging, and as a result, I think there was less interest in auscultation. But on the bright side, it led us to be able to develop image-based CFD as a way of looking at blood flow patterns from non-invasive medical imaging by combining them with CFD. Um, I would say the consensus was that turbulence is uncommon in the body except under exceptional circumstances. And I think this kind of led to the assumption of its polar opposite, laminar flow as being uh, common in the circulation. And even reading papers, even now you'll find people saying, as long as the Reynolds number is less than 2000, the flow must be laminar. Well, I have to remind you that that threshold for turbulent flow is based on 
you know, Reynolds work from the late 1800s on flow and straight pipes and a lot of cerebrovascular uh, and vascular vessels um, are not exactly what I would call straight pipes. And finally, I think, you know, starting in the 60s and especially through the 80s, um, we saw more of a focus on wall shear stress and their impact on endothelial cells and endothelial cell mechanobiology. And so there was less interest in vibration and its effect on uh, mural stresses and mural cells. So that brings me to the first story I want to tell you, which is the rediscovery of turbulence and cerebrovascular disease. So in 2003, we published the first patient-specific aneurysm CFD model. This was a clinical case brought to us by a neurosurgeon collaborator who had used these relatively new techniques known as coiling to treat the aneurysm essentially non-invasively or minimally invasively. And they noticed at follow-up that these, aneurys these aneurysm coils had been pushed to one side. And so he asked us to perform CFD, and we showed in this case that there was, you know, this kind of hammering of the jet leaving the parent artery and entering the aneurysm sac that might explain this, certainly circumstantial evidence. But within less than 10 years, we saw groups publishing not simple case studies, but actually hundreds of cases. On the left is a paper from Juan Sobral's group at George Mason University showing an association between high wall shear stress and wall shear stress gradients uh, with aneurysm rupture in 210 cases. And on the right from Hui Meng's group at SUNY Buffalo showing the opposite, low wall shear stress and high oscillatory shear with 119 cases. Now, this whole controversy of low versus high shear and aneurysms, I won't get into. It's sort of been resolved. But what I want to point out is that in neither of these papers, out of these hundreds of cases, there was any mention of turbulent or turbulent-like or vortex-shedding type flows. So in 2003, when we were doing our patient-specific CFD modeling, we were also starting to do some validation and in vitro studies. And this is a phantom of a basal or tip aneurysm model. And one of the questions we were interested in was whether contrast agent may actually be settling out um, during the scan and overestimating the amount of stagnation in a vessel. And you can see that in this experimental uh, angiogram. If you watch the contrast agent being injected and now watching it wash out, you'll be able to notice that the contrast agent seems to be kind of settling out, which may affect the way you interpret uh, the flow patterns. We also did some particle imaging, qualitative particle imaging studies in these cases. And then we did CFD. And I think you can see from the CFD simulations that there are some very high frequency flow phenomena going on here, whether they're vortex shedding or turbulence, we didn't really think about we assumed that all of this was, you know, because it was an idealized model, um, basal or tip aneurysm with symmetries in the model. So we never really went further with this data and didn't really publish on this idea of these flow instabilities here. In 2008, we attempted a more quantitative validation with particle image velocimetry in this patient specific basal or tip aneurysm model. And we noticed by looking at the CFD convergence, this is the L infinity or L2 norm, the convergence norms of the CFD as a function of time step over multiple cycles. And we noticed that the CFD itself never converged, um, suggesting that there were random, potentially chaotic or turbulent flow patterns in this case. And we did see cycle to cycle variations in the patterns that were consistent also with cycle to cycle variations that we saw with the particle imaging. But again, we kind of excuse this as maybe, you know, a single case, basal or tip aneurysms, maybe this is still an uncommon phenomenon. It wasn't really until 2011 when Christian Valensenstead, then a PhD student in Oslo, published this high fidelity CFD simulation of a middle cerebral artery aneurysm. And he told me afterwards that he had tried to converge this model with, you know, refining the mesh, refining the time steps, never got it to converge. And it was from this that he concluded that this may actually be a turbulent flow. And you can see the velocity traces that Christian extracted from this model. And he remarked upon how similar, qualitatively at least, 
they were with the kind of traces that Gary Ferguson had reported. So again, are these, you know, just, we just happen to find the handful of cases that have unstable flow, or are these highly unstable turbulent-like flow patterns more prevalent? So Christian joined my lab um, afterwards to do a postdoc, and the first study we did was, I think it was in 12 cases, we performed high-fidelity CFD and compared it to kind of out-of-the-box standard CFD that you would um, typically find as default settings in a solver and demonstrated that with a high-fidelity CFD, you can see these really strong variations in wall shear stress patterns, whereas they seem to be damped out by the typical CFD. And we found that, I think, in five out of the 12 cases. We subsequently showed a year later that it really had a lot to do with the numerics of the solver, the discretization schemes, rather than simply the mesh and time step resolution. We also noticed in some of our studies on looking at the initiation of aneurysms, where we digitally removed aneurysms from some of these cases in the internal carotid artery, that flow in this carotid artery siphon, basically where the internal carotid artery um, goes through the skull, we again started seeing these high frequency flow instabilities suggestive of turbulence or maybe again uh, laminar uh, vortex shedding. So it seems that it's not really that uncommon. And so my PhD student, Oase Khan, started probably around 2017 to do high fidelity CFD in 50 cases from the open source aneurysm database. And this is just showing a summary of these cases. And the colors basically represent the intensity of high frequency fluctuations. And we concluded that probably a third to a half of these cases have high frequency flow instabilities. Shown on the right is a plot of the intensity of those instabilities versus their frequency. And just to show you that these frequencies are on the order of about 100 to 200 hertz, except in some extreme cases that you can see here. But if you look at the red versus open circles, there doesn't seem to be any correlation between flow instability and rupture status. So the conclusion of all this up until now is that flow instabilities are not that rare in aneurysms, and that's consistent with the in vivo measurements that have been reported from the 70s and 80s, but that there doesn't seem to be any kind of clinical significance with rupture. And that leads me to the second story I want to tell you, which is going to kind of address that. <clears throat> so I always had a fascination with Doppler ultrasound. I did my postdoc in a medical imaging lab. I worked um, in a medical imaging lab as a scientist for many years. And I always liked the idea of using Doppler ultrasound as, for example, a way of visualizing CFD data that clinicians were sort of used to in terms of their visual conventions. We also considered using Doppler ultrasound because Doppler ultrasound measures velocities or frequencies using that information from Doppler ultrasound as a way of validating our CFD predictions in kind of an in indirect way. So what you see here is a typical Doppler ultrasound screen showing the artery in grayscale, the color Doppler in, um, in the orange colors denoting forward flow. And below, if you place a sample volume within the artery, you get this. This is called a spectrogram. It's time on the x-axis, frequency, namely the Doppler shift of the red blood cells on the vertical axis, which are converted via the Doppler equation to velocities. And the grayscale intensity just tells you how many red blood cells are moving at those speeds. So this is a, essentially a visual representation of the range of flow speeds within the vessel. But what you have to remember is that these are Doppler shifts, and what's actually measured are the frequencies of those Doppler shifts. So hopefully, I think I have to stop sharing for a moment because I think I forgot to share the audio. So just bear with me for a second. I'm going to reshare this with the sound on. I apologize for that. Okay. 
So hopefully you'll be able to hear this. So this is the sound that many of you have already heard the sound, um, probably on TV or if you've had a Doppler exam. That is the sound that the Doppler uh, machine is hearing, and the spectrogram is a visual representation of that sound. And I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Um, I also have always been fascinated with medical illustration as a way of clearly depicting complex you know, anatomy or complex function. Um, and also, as da Vinci showed us in the 1500s, some of the most effective flow visualizations that um, I think you'll still find. So in 2011, I gave a talk at a student-run conference in Toronto about scientific visualization, and I spoke to them about, you know, some of the figures that we had created for our visualizations. And after the talk, um, this fellow, Peter Coppin, came up to me and showed me this page from his notebook, his sketchbook, of these illustrations that he had made during my presentation. And I was fascinated by kind of these cartoonish representations of the CFD flow visualizations I had shown and how much I really appreciated and liked their simplicity. So that got us, um, that started a collaboration with us. And I was also fascinated because Peter at the time was doing his PhD, basically applying information theory, right? Shannon information theory to towards the optimization of visual representations. So I could give you a whole talk about Peter and my work on visualization, but Peter was interested in all kinds of representations, not just visual. So one of the things that Peter's group was working on was how to translate you know, the visual world, which is what the computer world is predominantly, to people who are visually impaired or blind. So one of the first things they started looking at was you know, financial charts. And how do you sonify a financial chart beyond just assigning frequency to these fluctuations. So one of the ideas that I had shown him was Doppler ultrasound. And I said, you know, if you think of, you know, these curves as maybe spectrograms, maybe you can use the idea of sonifying spectrograms as a way of communicating um, data in these charts. Now, admittedly, that work didn't go too far, but it did start a collaboration with Peter and I on sonification of CFD data. So you've seen this visualization before. This is the visualization created by Christian Valensenstad. And one of the first things we did was to have one of Peter's students who's actually doing his PhD in the drama department, but is a sound designer, design sounds for you know sets, uh, plays, things like that, to essentially score this movie to make it more evocative in terms of its sound. So I'm gonna play those sounds for you now. And I hope you can hear how those sounds kind of amplify what you're seeing visually in terms of the, you know, harmonic content or at least frequency content of those fluctuations, which got us thinking, you know, this might be an interesting way to communicate, you know, the frequency content of these flows while still being able to visualize the very complicated flow patterns. Um, of course, we can't have an artist designing every sonification. So my PhD student, or sorry, master student at the time, Dan McDonald, developed this interactive interface for sonifying CFD data on the fly. I'll just show you a brief bit of that. So the idea was to be able to interrogate data and to identify um, the places where frequency flow components are their strongest. What was most interesting from this, however, was that if these are the velocity signals that Dan was sonifying, the way he was sonifying them was to convert them via Fourier transform to a spectrogram. And the spectrogram is a visual representation, as we saw with Doppler ultrasound, of these sounds. And we started to notice that these spectrograms themselves offered us an interesting perspective on the flow instabilities in kind of a global or overall manner. So this led us to really look more closely at these spectrograms as kind of a, a one-stop shop representation of flow instability 
in these models. And in particular, for example, in this case, notice that the spectrogram has these horizontal bands. And these bands mean, remember, this is the x-axis is time, the y-axis is frequency. This means that there are these harmonic bands of concentrated frequencies, uh, concentrated energy at these very specific frequencies, suggestive of harmonic flow phenomena. Whereas in this example case, you see that there aren't those bands and it's more smooth. And this is more like a cascade of um, frequencies or more like noise that might suggest something more turbulent. So from this idea of looking at the spectrograms, we decided to make our sonifications a bit more sophisticated by breaking them up into, as you can see, there's both harmonic content and kind of noise content in the same cases, maybe because they come from different regions of the sac. And so we split up those features and assign them different tones. So what I want to show you now is a visualization of what's called Q criterion, which are the vortex cores in this aneurysm case. And you're going to see it cycle through uh, kind of fast, medium, and then slow. And I'm going to show you this without sound first, just so you can appreciate how complicated the flow patterns are in this case. Right, so you see this very high frequency vortex shedding. And it's, you know, kind of hard visually to get a sense of what those frequencies are and when the flow may be more turbulent, quote, or more harmonic. So now if I repeat this with sound, I don't think I have to instruct you as to what the sounds correspond to. I think you'll be able to figure that out. So we kind of like the idea that this way of sonifying the data would allow us to see when the flow had vortex shedding phenomena, even though we might not have visually cued into that without the sound being present. But taking this a step further, um, that master's student I would mentioned, Dan McDonald, is doing his PhD with me um, on using machine learning to look at flow um, in aneurysms. But one of the ideas he had given his background as a musician, he's a trained uh, classical pianist as well, was to look at these spectrograms in a way that musicians look at spectral data, which is to think of each one of these bands as a musical note, right? A, B, C, D, and so on. And by mapping the spectrogram to a chromogram, what you're essentially doing is that any harmonic that occurs at a frequency corresponding to the note A, whether it's 440, 220, or 880 hertz, gets assigned to the same band of this chromogram. That means that these regions of the chromogram, where the, all the energy is concentrated in one band, are indicative of harmonic phenomena, whereas if the energy is kind of more broadly spaced over multiple notes, it means that the, the data is more noisy. And he turned this um, into a quantity uh, known as bandedness. And what's interesting in coming back to the end of my previous story is that when Dan looked at those 50 cases, he found that bandedness was the only parameter that was able to predict rupture status with reasonable success and actually with statistically significant success compared to a bunch of other hemodynamic parameters that have been proposed in the literature. So we're quite excited by these results. Obviously, they're preliminary 50 cases, but what I wanted you to appreciate is how this all came about from an art science collaboration um, on sonification and how the sonification turned back into informing some of our kind of basic science and medical research. So coming to the last part of my talk, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, some other areas that we're working on that I think have opportunity, not just for us, but generally in the future. We made this poster for the APS's uh, Division of Fluid Dynamics meeting last fall, just to kind of show this process of going from CFD to spectrograms. And what Dan did here was to use um, a neural network to take all these spectrograms in and to kind of try to cluster them 
um, in an unsupervised way into similar types of spectrograms. And these clusters are what you see here as kind of these mountain ranges. What I want to also point out is that the idea for visually representing the spectrograms as mountain ranges came from, again, our work with Peter Coppin's group. Um, when we were trying to present and explain what spectrograms were, one of my students, Lucas Temmer, had the idea of 3D printing the spectrograms to be able to have the blind students kind of feel what these spectrograms were like and maybe even see whether they could understand the, the harmonic content from them. And that's what led us to this idea of, you know, this kind of 3D representation. Um, I think another critical development has been from Christian Valensensed's group on high fidelity fluid structure interaction modeling, which is now allowing us to perform high fidelity CFD of the high frequency flow components, but also how they induce vibration in the vessel wall in this very slowed down um, visualization. This is an example from uh, one of my PhD students, David Bruneau, He's showing what happens as you ramp up the flow rate to the spectra. Obviously, it eventually transitions to unstable flow. But what's interesting and you know expected is that the wall itself, its harmonic content is very narrow band because the wall is vibrating at its own resonant frequencies. Here, one frequency, and here you see a harmonic of that. Those of you who um, may have attended Michaela Bozzetto's talk yesterday, um, they're using the same software as to left SI, to look at vibrations in arteriovenous dialysis uh, fistulas and how these, this might help predict um, the failure of these dialysis grafts. Um, shown up here is one of my favorite poems from Lewis Fry Richardson, who is the grandfather of weather prediction and numerical methods and all sorts of stuff. I encourage you to look him up. He's a fascinating guy. But he anticipated the eddy cascade theory of turbulence by about 20 years. And the video on the right is from Harry Goldsmith, who is a pioneer of biorheology and developed great techniques to visualize red blood cell flow in small vessels. And this is a vessel on the order of 100 microns. And that had gotten us thinking about this question of, you know, if there is this eddy cascade of turbulence down to small flow features, what happens when those flow features start to approach this uh, scale where blood is really no longer a continuous fluid? And we hypothesize, and this is actually the brilliant idea of Luca Antigua, my former postdoc and the co-developer of VMTK, that perhaps these eddy cascades can't be unimpeded once you start to get to these scales. And this was kind of our first attempt to try to think about that. But I think there's a lot of questions about what happens in turbulence when you have these uh, not so simple fluids. And finally, the question is, what happens in the, the vessel walls? What happens biologically? Can endothelial cells even sense these high frequency fluctuations in wall shear stress? Do the cells within the vessel wall actually respond to high frequency vibrations? And do endothelial cells respond to these vibrations? These are open questions that haven't really been dealt with in the literature, there are a few papers, some examples I've shown here, but I think they haven't really been looked at too carefully because there hasn't really been a lot of good data or models of these types of flows. So just to kind of wrap up um, the theme of the talk, this is an example from a paper published a couple of years ago where they use patterns of vibration to drive um, cardiomyocytes, heart cells, to form clusters, you know, close clusters and sort of sparse clusters of cells. And coming back to everything old is new again, this dates back to the work of Ernst Klodny, who was kind of considered the father of acoustics for his work on visualizing um, vibration patterns on plates. So with that, I'd like to thank you for attention. I'd like to thank my current group members and former group members. Uh, my mentors um, over the years and my collaborators, and of course, the people um, who have funded this work over the years. Thank you very much, and I'd be very happy to take any questions you may have.
Thank you, David, for this fantastic talk. Not only science, but also art, and I would say a lot of fun. Uh, intriguing. Uh, so, is there any question from the audience? Oh, I see. Um, looks like Ross Ethier has a comment here. Thank you, Ross. Ross is a uh, was my PhD supervisor. I was actually his first PhD student, as a matter of fact. Um, so he asked, if unsteady flow phenomena are more common in human anatomists than we thought, what does that mean for platelet function in addition to endothelial function? It's a very good question. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. Um, again, I think a lot has to do with kinetics, like how fast are these fluctuations do do platelets, can they experience these very fast transients in wall shear stress or, or sorry, shear rates? Uh, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't know. Okay. Julia, for some reason, I can't see the question on the chat. I don't know why. So unless Jerome can. I think that you have to raise your hand. So I, I have a question for you, David, uh, that mm -hmm. is related to one of your last point and is uh, about uh, uh, the fate of uh, uh, turbulence and eddies when you get to the scale of uh, cells. Mm -hmm. uh, is it damping? Is it uh, collision? What, what is going on in your opinion at that level? different from standard food I, I suspect it's both. Like, I think there's collision phenomenon. This is what the rethinking turbulence paper kind of showed that as, and as red blood cells get very close, you end up with something like a couette flow with very high shear stresses that may be generated. That's going to cause viscous dissipation, obviously, so that may be part of the energy cascade. But I also suspect there is some viscoelastic effects going on. And one of the reasons for that is we did some CFT simulations of purely shear thinning fluids versus Newtonian fluids in a stenosis and found that there was a difference in the transition Reynolds number by about 10 per, by about 10 percent. So the shear thinning delayed the transition to turbulence by about a Reynolds number of 10 percent. Frank Loth's group at Akron has been doing experiments with blood at body temperature, and he showed um, transition delays on the order of up to 20 percent. So it's possible, you know, we didn't match their experiments perfectly, but it's possible their transitions delayed a bit more because they may be accounting for viscoelastic effects that our simple shear thinning models don't account for. So I suspect both may be involved, but Again, you know, how how fast can cells respond to those transients? I think that's a, a big question. OK, and another point, uh, you didn't mention uh, how to model turbulence. <laughs> this we, is a new simulation that is yeah. an issue. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we don't use any turbulence models. We we do what I, I think is called quasi DNS. And I remember years ago, I talked to Spencer Sherwin, who is you know one of the gurus of direct numerical simulation, and I said, I don't want to call what we do DNS. And he said, Well, the fact is, if you're not introducing a turbulence model explicitly. As long as your solver is minimally dissipative, maybe you're not resolving all the way down to the Kolmogorov scale, but it is a kind of DNS. I'm not a big fan of turbulence models. Um, we looked at K omega models, two equation models, years and years ago. And, you know, for pulsatile flows, for relaminarizing flows, I just don't think they capture the behavior very well. I think large eddy simulation is is better for sure, but again, you know there are all these parameters you can tune to get the LES to match experiment. But when you change the type of flow from I don't know a hard valve to an aneurysm, do they still apply? So our philosophy is to use as you know a minimally dissipative, high order solver, at least second order solver, and you know go brute force. <laughs> 
you know, I think that the, the FDA round robin of some years ago got to the almost same conclusions. I mean, yeah. railing is a mess. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. Is there any question from the audience? Raise your hands. There are questions in the chat. Uh, oh. Maybe, David, you can read sure. it right. OK, so let me go. Let me just go back. Um, Ross. Another question is this thoughts from Polly Blakey. My PhD is aiming to use ultrasound produced in the knee naturally to diagnose osteoarthritis. I don't think we are hearing turbulence, but more the lack of full film lubrication or space in the joint space itself. I do not know if turbulence in synovial fluid has been looked at or whether it wouldn't be of use. I suspect in there you're hearing kind of rumble of, you know, the structural rumble. I think the Reynolds numbers are probably too low in the synovial fluid to be turbulent. That would be my guess. Um, so Philippe Westberg has a question. Um, I listened to some talks about cell dynamics. Do you have a comment on applying fluid structure interaction simulation to visualization on cell dynamics? Uh, we don't. Um, I'm sure it could be done. But again, the big question is going to be what properties do you assign? How sophisticated are your wall models? So I think that's for someone much braver than me to look into. And I'm sorry if all my questions are kind of let somebody else do it. But a lot of these things really, I, I kind of wanted to make that clear. You know, I think there are a lot of interesting possibilities for the future, um, because not just because of our work in this area, obviously, but I think others are starting to see these flows as well. Um, Andrew Cookson was asking, I was wondering what your reflections are about the science art collaboration process. Would you recommend it to others? Oh, Andrew, I could give an entire talk about this. We actually have a paper um, that, sh that is online now with the Leonardo Art Science Journal describing our collaboration. And I think what I would say is the best art science collaborations are with between scientists who genuinely appreciate what artists do and aren't just using artists as kind of a way to make pretty pictures, and artists who understand and appreciate the scientific process. Artists don't like to be used just for kind of PR, so it really has to be an organic and meeting of equals with complementary skills and interests. So that's kind of how I'd say um, it works the best, at least in my experience. Um, Irene has a question. Thank you, Irene. Um, in CMBBE 2010, you looked at several examples of what we th we got on periodic flow, but I never thought about the consequences. Do you suggest we should, in general, in cardiovascular flows and frequency content? Of I, I I think yeah, I think you know, like I remember Charlie Taylor. Um, you know, I think it was Andrea Less, one of his students. You know, looked at um, exercise conditions in the aorta. Right. And, you know, they showed that as they refined the CFD to like 36 million elements, they saw, you know, more and more unstable flow. So I would say if you're seeing anything that harks a flow instability, um, it's worth looking at. I'll give you an example. Like, I don't want to I don't want to be seen to be crapping on the people who have published in the aneurysm CFD literature. Like Juan Sobral, for example, is a superb CFD mechanician. and his CFD simulations, he is using an implicit solver with very few time steps, but I've seen some of his visualizations and he does seem to be detecting jet instabilities, but because he's not using very large times or very small time steps, he's only kind of picking up a, an echo of those instabilities. So I wonder if he would run at higher um, time step or number, higher number of time steps, would he see higher frequency components? So if in your simulations you're seeing aperiodic flows or low frequency flow instabilities, I think the question would be what happens if you try to resolve those a bit further? Um, so we have time for one more last question. Okay, so then, yeah, I see a talk from U15532. Brilliant talk, thank you very much.
Robust science applied to out-of-the-box thinking, thank you. I have a question, would you need to take into account the impulse response of the surrounding tissues? Ooh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, there are some groups who are starting to do that. We're actually interested in, in acoustic modeling, and that's one of the things we'll be looking at in acoustic modeling, how these flow features actually transmit and respond to, you know, the, the properties of the surrounding tissues. It's a tough question to answer, and I think we're really only in our infancy, um, but I think it's, it's, I would say it's the next thing we should be looking at once we've tackled kind of basic fluid structure interaction. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, David. We have to move to the last two session of today and of the ESB 2021. Thank you again for this brilliant, brilliant uh, talk that opened our mind and uh, see you in the following sessions. Okay, thanks everyone. See you later. Bye.